Hello and welcome to the Circuit Python Weekly for February eighteenth, twenty twenty. Uh, it's a Tuesday, which is not our normal day, but uh, thanks to everybody who's been able to make it. Uh, yesterday was a U.S. holiday, so we bumped it from Monday to Tuesday. Uh, next week is not a U.S. holiday, so we'll be on Monday again as well. Um, for those of you uh, who are new to this, uh, you can join. Our meeting every Monday at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on the Adafruit Discord server, which is adafru.it slash discord. And um, I just wanted to double check. Could somebody say something and make sure that I can hear other folks? Um, yep. The... Okay, Ooh. perfect. Yep. Thank you. Um, I just want, I didn't want to get too far into the like spiel without realizing that like not everything was working in case I had to start over. So um, that's a good thing to talk about. Uh, this me meeting is recorded, so I'm recording the voice channel and the text channel of CircuitPython on the Discord. It gets posted as a uh, as a podcast. It gets posted on the Adafruit YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Adafruit. Uh, both of those places have, have links to the notes document, and then the notes document actually has links back to the video as well. Uh, there's a GitHub, GitHub repo full of the notes docs, uh, so you can go back and look at all of the m weekly meetings that we've had in the past, what we talked about, and those notes also include time codes. So if you don't want to listen to the full uh, meeting, uh, it tends to be about an hour, uh, you can check out the notes doc for that. Um, the meeting is done in five parts. We start off with uh, community news, which is a general overview of things that are happening on the web. Uh, pertaining to CircuitPython. Uh, typically, Phil does this uh, on Mondays, but Tuesdays he's got a meeting that, that overlaps, so I'll read those off today. Um, after that, we do State of CircuitPython Libraries in Blinka, uh, which is a kind of statistics overview of the health of the project, giving us hopefully a, uh, a more objective look at the health of the project. Uh, and thank you to whomever uh, snagged those and put those in the docs. I, I tend to forget them. <laughs> uh, after a state of CircuitPython and its libraries, we do hug reports. Uh, hug reports is a chance for us to just say uh, thank you to everyone, uh, or thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing within the community. Um, we do that as a round robin, so I will start, and then we'll go down the list of folks. Um, a bunch of you have already said that you're lurking, which I appreciate. Uh, for those of you who don't know, lurking just means that you only want to listen. You don't want to speak out or, or have anything to say. Uh, if you don't want to use the voice chat, you can also say uh, just that you're text only, and I'll read them off on your behalf as well. Um, so we go around and, and around Robin that way. Um, and then the next section after Hug Reports is a status updates, which is a, a chance to say a couple minutes, take a couple minutes about what you've been working on and what you plan on working on in the future. And uh, that's a good way for people to keep track of what who's doing what and provide tips and tricks for uh, what, uh, like, if somebody's working on something that you worked on previously, you could say, oh, take a look at this or beware of that uh, is one way to, one benefit that comes from status updates. And then lastly, uh, after status updates, we have a section called in the weeds. This is kind of our catch all section where we could potentially have long conversations about uh, any CircuitPython related topic. Uh, it is used, uh, or the way that it works is that for folks who have topics, you just drop them in the notes doc, which was sent out in the text channel. Um, and you can say your username and kind of what the topic is about. And then we'll just toss it over to you uh, to explain the questions you have or the thing that you'd like to talk about. And people can chime in and uh, we can make some decisions. So uh, if you have any topics that, that kind of come to mind as we're listening to Hug Reports, Data Circuit Python, all those sorts of things, uh, hop in the notes doc, drop those in the weeds, and uh, we'll get to those at the end. Um, I think that's it. Uh, so I'll take a time code, and we'll jump into community news. Let's see. So uh, for community news, uh, first thing is there's a new video up from CircuitPython Day in Beirut, which is super cool. Um, the video is from the CircuitPython Day celebration uh, last year, organized by Lambda Labs. And this uh, is kind of an overview of all the things that they did on CircuitPython Day, which is really, really neat. I highly recommend uh, 
checking that out and I will just post a link to it here as well. Um, next up, there is a new uh, Blue Fruit Playground app update. Uh, I actually don't know what's involved in it. Uh, I think it includes the puppet module, which is super cool. You can use the accelerometer in, uh, on the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit to control a puppet, which is really neat. And thank you for posting the link. Uh, after that, uh, there is forever more updates on the testing of the Open Hardware Summit 2020 wristwatch badge. Uh, there's a link there. Uh, thanks to Katni for dropping those in. Uh, about the latest updates, I think they're like very close to getting to production on that. And we'll, I'm sure we'll hear, or I know Drew left some notes, and I'll read those off later about the Open Hardware Summit badge. Uh, and if you are going to be there, let us know. A number of us will be there. We'd love to meet up and, and say hi. Um, okay. After that, we have Circuit Brains boards. Uh, they're castellated modules that are coming soon. Uh, I believe they're coming soon to Crowd Supply. Um, so those look really, really neat. There's a, the castellations, for those of you who don't know, are a way for you to mount uh, one PCB onto another. Um, you basically... It's like a semicircle with the, it's got the gold in the inside. So you kind of solder between like a flat pad and the inside of the semicircle on the edge of the PCB on top. That's what a castellation is. Um, next up, special thanks to Andrew and the Adafruit Community Discord server for making this clue pin out. Uh, there is an AI file to download at the link there. Um, I believe that's Andrew Tribble who's in the meeting. So thank you, Andrew. Um, it's always cool to see pinouts for things and, and help explain to people how things are connected or how to connect up to them. Uh, next up, we have CircuitPython is bringing, or CircuitPython is bringing Python to more developers and makers around the world. Uh, it's a link from Anwisha uh, on Twitter uh, and uh, talking about Pi Ladies Pune work, workshop that she did there. And lastly, uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, Phil has been kind of leading the charge on uh, documenting all of the awesome forks of MicroPython and what they do and how they relate to each other and putting them on a timeline. So if, if you're curious about the kind of family tree of MicroPython, uh, check out that GitHub repo there. If you have uh, information about it that, that's not documented there, please make a PR. Uh, but it's really cool to see... Um, how people build on MicroPython for different use cases and, and what they've chosen to do and how they've modified it. So uh, if you're curious about MicroPython family, check that out. Okay, uh, that was the community news. Next up, we have State of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Uh, I will start. Um, this is, again, just a, a, an objective kind of statistics overview of the health of the project meant to ground us in like stats that we care about. Uh, usually goes pretty quick. Uh, so first up, we have uh, overall. Uh, overall, we had 30 pull requests merged from 15 di different authors. Uh, a lot of those folks look new to me. Uh, some of the new names in here are RSEST, and I think Foosmeet is new, and NNJA, Nina, is uh, off and on. So thank you to all of those uh PRs. Uh, we had nine reviewers, which is uh, definitely a number that's growing. So thank you to all our reviewers. Um, and as always, if you want to get started, reviewing is actually a great way. Um, you can find a pull request that's outstanding uh, on circuitpython.org slash contributing. If you have the hardware, you can test it and you can chime in and say, hey, like this, look, this looks good to me. It works for me. And uh, we can speed up the process to get those things merged in. Issues-wise, we had 12 closed issues by 11 people uh, and 7 open by 6 people. So we're net down on issues overall, uh, which is a great place to be. And so thank you to everybody who's both filed issues and then the folks that have fixed them as well. Uh, overall, uh, on the core side, we're uh, getting closer and closer to a 5.0 release candidate. Uh, this is basically once we have all the things uh, we want to fix for 5.0 done and we just want people to try it find any bugs and we'll fix the bugs that are major. Uh, I think we're getting quite close to that and uh, maybe we should talk about that later if we have time. Uh, on the library side, it just continues to grow. I think, uh, you know, we passed 200 
libraries and I fully expect us to just keep growing in terms of the library count. So thank you to everybody who uh, takes the time to accept PRs and merge PRs and give feedback on the libraries. It's a huge undertaking, uh, but it is really where the value comes from CircuitPython. Um, and yeah, so let's uh, go into the core. Uh, I will talk about the core. So on the core side, we had six pull requests merged from five different authors. So thank you to those authors. Um, and uh, we had four reviewers as well. I just remembered I should give another hug report. Spoiler alert. Um, I'm messing up my flow. Remind me to thank James. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, so that's for pull requests, uh, for reviewers. Thank you to the reviewers. We had 10 open pull requests as at the time these uh, were, the stats were taken. We have two that are over 190 days old that we should take a look at and reevaluate. I think one we could just uh, fix up and, and merge. And then the other one, I can't remember, I think is F strings and we'll have to ping that upstream as well. Uh, but generally, uh, our pull requests are moving through the pipeline pretty quickly. We don't have a huge backlog, which is great. Uh, Issue-wise, we had five closed issues by five people and two open by two people. So we're actually net down this week, which is great, uh, for a total of 252 open issues. Uh, if you want to check out the uh, all of the issues, you can go to github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython slash issues, and you can see all of the open issues there. Uh, we have eight active milestones, uh, and uh, if you want to see a breakdown of where issues are allocated to those different milestones, check out the notes doc, but I will not read those off. And uh, again, uh, I think we've confused GitHub with how many release assets we have, so uh, no download stats this week. Uh, let's kick it over to Katni and the, for an update on the libraries. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So on the library side of things, we had 24 pull requests merged from 12 different authors, including RSS, uh, Foosmeet, and Ninja as well. Um, and we had nine reviewers, which is excellent. Uh, we merged pull requests over the course of the week that were a maximum of six days old. So we're doing really well with keeping up with that. Um, and quite a number of them were merged the same day, which is great. Uh, we had seven closed issues by seven people and five opened by five pe or five opened by four people rather, uh, leaving us with 141 open issues. If you are interested in um, seeing the list of those issues, you can go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. We currently have 25 open pull requests. The oldest one is 407 days old, which last I knew was a work in progress. And the newest one is uh, probably zero days. Um, it shows one when it's actually zero. So we had two new libraries in the last week and a number of updated libraries, a list I will not read off as it is fairly long. Um, if you go to circuitpython.org slash contributing, all this information, or slash libraries, uh, this information is there. And if you go to slash contributing, you can find a list of open pull requests and open issues. And uh, that's a great way, as Scott mentioned, to get started contributing um, as per the link name. Um, and you can take a look at what's there, see if anything interests you, see if you have any um, of the hardware, uh, see whether uh, anything speaks to you, and just take a look at it um, and make a note of what you do and uh, let us know. Um, and we uh, then can move forward with uh, whatever that PR or issue is. Um, if you have any questions on any of it, feel free to ping one of us, um, either on Discord or on GitHub. And we'll be able to answer any questions about issues and that sort of thing. Um, and we can always get you get you help getting started with Git and GitHub. We have a guide for it, and we are available throughout the week to assist. And that's where we are with the libraries. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. All right. Uh, next up, we have Melissa and talking about Blinka. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so this week we have uh, one pull request merged by one author, myself, and two reviewers. Um, there was one open pull request uh, still. It's 12 days old, and there were one closed issue by one person and two open by two people. 
There are still 33 open issues, and there were 2,450 PyPI downloads in last week. And we have 38 boards currently supported. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, next up, we have Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance for us to say th thank you to other folks in the community for the awesome work they've been doing. This is both nice because it's nice to hear the cool things that are happening, and it's a great way for us to kind of recognize as a community the, the things that we value. Um, we do this as a round robin, so if you uh, have... Uh, are just listening in, uh, let us know that you're lurking. Uh, if you don't have a microphone or choose not to speak, uh, let us know that you're text only. And uh, we, we should have a note of that in the doc. Um, so if you want to do us a huge favor, uh, double check there and make sure the doc is correct as well. Um, I'll do my best uh, to make sure that we don't skip anybody who's not in the doc, but I think we've gotten everyone. So that should be good. Uh, I'm going to start as an example, kind of the host tends to do that and then we'll go down the list and I will read off the lurking ones or the folks that aren't missing or that aren't available this meeting either um, okay so first for me uh, a hug report to v923z uh, I'm gonna s <laughs> scoop this from some other folks but uh, I, I believe their name is Zoltan uh, is the uh, author of ULab which is a, uh, num uh, a NumPy-like library for both MicroPython and CircuitPython. And I just wanted to say a hug report to them for being an open and awesome maintainer. Uh, they've been very engaged with both Jeff and I about uh, how to improve ULab for both MicroPython and CircuitPython. Uh, and re I really appreciate uh, that enthusiasm and, and that uh, engagement. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, you know, it's not just code. That, that matters, but they're, they're willing to do that, and I appreciate it a lot. Um, thank you to Dave Putz for taking a look at improving Unicode support. There's an open issue on GitHub about uh, not being able to copy and paste like some Unicode stuff, and uh, I really appreciate Dave picking that up and, and figuring out why it's doing that, and I'm excited to get uh, better Unicode support in the REPL. Um, thank you to Jimmo from the MicroPython uh, kind of core project uh, for brainstorming with me last week about uh, garbage collection and, and heap allocation things. Uh, Dan and uh, Lady Ada had found this really pathological case where like allocations get very, very, very slow. And uh, Jimmo had done a really good talk at the Melbourne MicroPython meetup about um, the GC and some optimizations that he was playing with. And so we got together and chatted and I really, really appreciated that. Uh, from Jimmo, and then also really appreciated the uh, just Jimmo's engagement on the MicroPython forum and the, the GitHub asking questions, particularly around uh, the ULab stuff as well. Been a huge help. Um, thank you to Mubes for the IMX RT work. Uh, the IMX RT, as you folks may know, is a re very exciting chip, but it's very early on in the code base, so. Uh, Muse has been expanding that and adding support for things. So I really, really appreciate it. Uh, excited to <laughs> uh, do that. Um, thank you to oh, another one I forgot. Uh, I wanted to thank Katni for covering me on the newsletter this weekend. I was gone for all three days. Uh, I was gone skiing and snowshoeing and stuff for that. And it was nice to come back and, and recognize that uh, Katni had understood I was going to be gone and done the stuff that I'm supposed to do. So I really appreciate that, Katni. And thank you for adding a hug report to yourself to the docs as well. <laughs> um, thank you to Allah and Hassan from Lambda Labs in Beirut for bringing CircuitPython to their community and on YouTube. Again, I put a link there. Uh, started emailing them and interacting with them on Twitter. Excited to, to see that. Um, and uh, lastly, thank you to James Bowman, who's uh, the creator of Game... Duino, which is a shield for uh, Arduinos that does a uh, larger screen output, basically uses like a, a, an inexpensive kind of, it's almost a GPU, but not quite a GPU, but like a graphics IC. And uh, James and I went back and forth on, on adding the EVE module uh, to CircuitPython, and I'm happy to see that get checked in and, and have CircuitPython uh, support show up there. Okay. Uh, those are my hug reports. Now we're going to go down the list uh, and I will read uh, folks off that are marked as uh, 
text only. So um, first uh, we have hug reports from TG Techie. Uh, TG Techie says, uh, community hug and a hug to Tan Newt for helping with display AO and entertaining my questions. And I think that V923Z is still working on it or it's being copied from somewhere. So I'm actually going to skip back. So next up is Andrew. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, sounds good. Uh, just want to send a uh, hug report to Tan Newt and Lady Ada for uh, helping clarify the discrepancy between the net pin names and chip pin names uh, from the Adafruit clue schematic while working on that pinout diagram that we were talking about earlier in the community news. Um, when you go through the schematic, there's a bunch of places where some of the analog names on the net name actually don't match what they are named on the uh, chip pin. And it turns out most of that was to do with porting over the pin names from the microbit. Hmm. Um, so that was extraordinarily helpful in working on that and kind of making that process a little bit less confusing. Um, and then also to Katni for the newsletter exposure for that same uh, pinout diagram. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome. Uh, okay, next up we have Brent. Hello, um, hug reports this week to Dan and Higher Effects for hanging out last week in Boston and talking CircuitPython. It was a good time. Um, V923Z for ULab work. Um, I'm excited about that. And Artero for IMX RT work. And whoever else is involved with the IMX RT work. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. Okay, next up we have C. Grover, who wasn't able to make the meeting. Uh, but Seagrover says a hug report to Carter, Brent, and Maker Melissa for the essential detail in the CircuitPython display support using Display.io and adding cursor support to CircuitPython learning guides. The fusion of the two helped me successfully move beyond just labels, bitmaps, and shapes to tile grid and buttons. Still have a ways to go, but the concepts are increasingly making more sense and have found a way into my most recent project. Thank you, Seagrover. Um... Charles, are you lurking? Just noticed you dropped in. No, I'd like to give a general hug report to everybody because I'm just now trying out 5.0 and it seems to be doing a lot, a lot of good for some of my code. Thank you. Great, thanks Charles. All right, next up we have Dan. Okay, so um, I'll... Uh... Plus one on the um, thanking V923Z and also Jeff Epler for continuing to work on uh, ULab, adding new capabilities to it, like convolving and integrating it into CircuitPython and thinking about its overall structure and kind of strategic correction, which is really great. Um, as, as Brent mentioned, um, Lucien arranged a meetup at the Artisan Style of Medicare Space in Somerville um, which had very small attendance, but it got uh, the three of us together and we had a good time. And another person also came along with us for dinner and stuff. We, it was, a, it was a ni just a nice time. Uh, thanks to uh, a couple of people for CircuitPython PR's uh, MUBES, which you mentioned already, Scott and Dave Putz, and there are other people that I forgot. Those I just want to thank those people for, for who have started uh, submitting PR's. And then there's a project going on in the background, which you'll see, which has to do with uh, bicycle sensors and heart rate sensors and the clue. And a lot more work is going on in the background with Dylan and John Park and the Rees brothers. And it's, it's going great. And it's really, it's like a really sort of a stress test of all the BLE stuff that we've been doing and all the new hardware. It's, it's, uh, it's, it'll be really great. And then thanks to Jeff for pointing out a problem with uh, SPI on NRF that I was only sending like eight or six, eight bytes at a time or something because I misunderstood that something was the width of a field rather than the number of bytes. Okay, that's it. All right, thanks, Dan. Okay, and next up we have David Glaub. I think is uh, text only. 
So uh, David says, uh, thank you to Dan H. and John Park for the BLE and heart rate support demo. Uh, thank you to Katni for clue library and documentation. And lastly, thank you to Maker Melissa for display IO stuff that made the same code work on clue, PyPortal, and PyGamer. All right, thanks, David. Okay, next up we have notes from Drew Fustini. Drew says, uh, thank you to Ax Alex Camilo for hint building awesome test jig for open hardware summit wrist badges um thank you to alex again for hand assembling rev one badge to test so that we can go to production thank you to sedacious for testing rev zero uh, wrist badge and giving feedback thank you to michael welling diagnosing issues with rev zero and helping validate rev one and lastly thank you to kevin walseth at digikey for doing an awesome job supporting the project badge project by getting the components we need awesome Okay, thanks, uh, Drew, for those notes, uh, and let's go to Foamy Guy. Uh, my hog reports this week, I got one for Carter. Uh, I, I think he made this maybe last week, but I just got around to checking it out this week, the Candy Hearts uh, Learn Guide. Um, and especially, I like the the diagram in there that illustrates the, the anchored positioning on the labels. Um, so thanks for that. And then uh, also, um, thanks for feedback on a couple PRs. Um, goes out this week to Carter and Maker Melissa, as well as Sedacious and uh, D. Harada. So thank you to all of you folks. And uh, I didn't write it in there, but group hug for everyone because CircuitPython is awesome. <laughs> thanks, Foamy Guy. All right. Next up, we have Geek Guy. Uh, you're marked as text only. Do you want to put stuff in? Let's keep rolling. Oh, here we go. Anonymous Camel says, <laughs> um, hug report to maker Melissa for helping me through doing the HTK 16K33. <laughs> All right, let's go to Jeff, and I'll circle back with Geek Guy after it's it's written out. Hi again, Scott, and everybody. And uh, I just want to thank Zoltan uh, once more for all this work he's been doing in MicroPython ULab. Um, you know, we showed up and said, "Why don't you reorganize all your code?" <laughs> and he's he's doing it, and that's just um, wonderful that he would listen to what we needed and judge that it was the right thing to do for him as well. Uh, I also want to thank the people at Adafruit for giving the, me the freedom to go on vacation and kind of be flaky and not check in as much and not work very much, but uh, I'll be back in a couple weeks. <laughs> Thanks to Katni for taking notes because, you know, I'm watching you put in your typos and then delete your typos and, you know, that's that's not a lot of fun, but somebody's got to do it. So thank you. And uh, group hug to everybody. Um, you're, you're great people and I love spending time with you. Aw, thanks, Jeff. Okay, uh, Katni. Hello. So I have a hug report for Foamy Guy for sticking through many change requests on PRs. I know it can get uh, frustrating um, at times, uh, or perhaps not. But either way, uh, there's been a lot of change requests on going by. I saw on PRs that you've been doing, and you've been uh, going through them all really well. So thank you for that. Um, I want to give a hug report to Nina for fixing up the PyBadger library. Um, while she works through using the code, there is a slight refactor to make things more readable and removing uh, some unnecessary documentation. So thank you for that. Uh, to Dan for being a sounding board about some code plans uh, regarding PyBadger, actually. Um, I added support for Clue, scooping my, um, my status update, added support for Clue and realized that it needed to be refactored, but I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going down completely the wrong track um, with refactoring the entire library, because I'd much rather find that out before I do it. And uh, so I talked to Dan about it, and Dan agreed that that was the way to go. So thank you for that. Uh, to Maker Melissa for testing the PyBadger code that I'm writing on PyBadge, since I managed to end up without one. Should be here today, but um, that was not guaranteed. So thank you very much for that. 
And finally, a hug report for Anwisha Das for running her first large circuit Python workshop for Pi Ladies Pune. Um, she uh, has helped people in smaller groups, but this is the first large scale tutorial that she's put on. Uh, and she did a really great job. She learned a lot. Um, and so did everybody that she taught. So congratulations on that. Awesome. Thanks, Katni. All right. Next up, we have Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, first of all, I wanted to give a hug report to Geekkai for your enthusiasm with coding the HT16K33. A uh, hug report to NNJA for your Pi Badger PRs to help refactor and improve the code. A hug report to Foamy Guy for making all the changes requested on the display text and background color PR. And a group hug. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. All right, next up we have Sedacious. I appear to have lost my notes. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Oh, here it is. Okay. Hug reports. Yes, that section now. Okay, good. Um, here I'm somewhere grumbling, grumbling. Uh, here. Okay, sorry. First off, um, one to 18 Makers Bill, aka Bill Binko, or vice versa, for um, teaching me about Sip and Puffs and assistive tech in general for um, my uh, Sip and Puff guide. Uh, another thanks to and hug report for Drew Festini uh, for helping me get my um, badge proto um, flashed. Uh, there was a step that I missed, um, and as soon as you pointed it out, it was super easy and worked great. Um, one more for uh, Drew Diablo on the forums. Um, he posted a question about trying to make a, a arc-shaped graph. I posted a, um, a picture of what he's trying to go for uh, in the chat there, and uh, they claim to not be a programmer or mathematician, and I think both of those things are untrue because <laughs> they've done a really good job of making the graphs work so far, um, but they just ran into one rounding-based bug that we're going to try and work out. Um, but I, I told them that it would be a great addition to the Display Shapes library. Um, so hopefully we'll see that before too long. Um, and that is it for me. Awesome. Thank you. OK. Uh, I did. Looks like I missed a couple. Uh, but first, we'll go to Summersoft, and then I'll, I'll circle back and cover the ones that I missed. So uh, let's go to Summersoft, who I think is text only, um, but is in the meeting, which is exciting. Uh, so Summersoft says, hug report to uh, C. Sexton for their quick attention regarding updates to the release assets uploads GitHub action, and a group hug to everyone. Thank you, Summersoft. Glad you could come back and uh, hang out with us for a little while longer. Um, I missed... Uh, I don't see notes from Muse. Okay, yeah. Uh, the last one I have is from V923Z. Uh, and I'll read those off now after I take a time code. Uh, they say, uh, Hug Reports, Jeff Epler, and Tan Newt, myself. For all the encouraging uh, encouragement concerning the integration of ULAB into CircuitPython, thank you to Dan H and A Gatherer for taking the first steps in porting ULAB to CircuitPython, and a group hug, the whole CircuitPython community for the extremely welcoming and friendly atmosphere. Awesome. All right. Well, that was uh, hug reports. Thank you to everybody for uh, dropping a note and taking the time to thank others for the work that they've been doing. Uh, next up, we do in a similar fashion, but it's uh, called status updates. This is where you take just a brief amount of time to talk about what you've been working on both in the last week and what you plan on doing in the coming week. Uh, it's a great way just to keep track of all the th cool things that people are doing and potentially help them out with the work as well. Um, so I'll start and then we'll go around the list just like I did last time. And uh, okay, so for me, I, uh, last week was a bit, uh, I got distracted a, a, a couple times, but I think, uh, good things came out of it. Uh, the first distraction I had was, uh, 
Dan and Lady Ada had found this weird case where uh, sampling a sensor was very, very slow. Uh, and if you looked on an oscilloscope, it would, between I squared C reads, it would vary between one millisecond and 10 milliseconds, which is a ton. Uh, and so we figured out that there was this weird case where if your code, circuit Python code, is allocating um, multiple, like all the memory allocations are more than a single block. It actually gets very, very slow as you do that more and more. So I took a day last week and fixed that up. Um, and so I just want to say, uh, you're, if folks see that their code's running faster, that's a good thing. Um, try it out with your latest projects and let us know whether it's faster or slower. I think it should be generally faster. Um, I had a discussion with Jimmo uh, from MicroPython that said they found a similar thing but chose not to do it because their performance benchmarks did slow down just a smidge, uh, like, two or three percent uh but i think in general I, i'm kind of betting that uh more real world uses will actually find uh speed ups so uh let me know if that's true uh and if you want to more, know more details about that let me know too i'm happy to talk about it uh but i won't do it here the other thing i kind of cycled off and did was i uh, re-added support for Bewley's eddy stone uh which is a kind of a standard uh um, Jeff, can you mute? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, the Eddy Stone library is a way to just like share URLs with a beacon. It was pretty big in Android for a little while, and they've actually kind of rolled back some of that support, but still pretty handy. Uh, and so I added that uh, last week. I need to polish it up this week. It's super close. I just need to lint it. And uh, it was also the first thing to pick up black, which is interesting too. So formatting from black. Uh, and should get that out, and I think we'll see a guide from John Park this week on that as well. Um, besides those two things, I be, I began working on uh, I've been working on this broadcast net thing, which is basically just put sensors around your house that that uh, broadcast sensor data, and then we just listen for all those broadcasts and we pump pipe them up to Adafruit IO. Uh, I was playing around with adding support uh, for that in Ras on the Raspberry Pi because the network is hopefully more reliable and it's got Ethernet on it, which is cool. Uh, I got that working and I also, I, the way I did it is by basically implementing the scanning part of the underscore BLEIO library. Um, so I'm going to keep working on that this week. It's not perfect. It still does miss broadcasts and things. Uh, there's one kind of showstopper bug where it the underlying library doesn't really handle if the Bewley stack of Linux is in a different state than it expected. So I'm going to track that down and finish that up this week. Uh, it'll at least give kind of like two options as to how you bridge between that Bewley broadcast world and like the Adafruit IO world. Uh, speaking of that, the other way is to do uh, to use the ESP32 spy library, uh, which as I was playing around with it originally, I found some things that I wanted to change. So I've got some pending changes that I need to get uh, checked in for ESP32 spy as well. Um, and then people will have the option to kind of like using a Raspberry Pi for a bridge or not. Um, broadcast net, I think is in de decent enough shape uh, that, you know, once everything's in, people will want to start playing with it. It's just very, it's a very simple, not super reliable way to collect uh, data over time. But uh, like if you have, um, if you have a temperature sensor and it logs every 10 minutes or whatever, like you can pretty pretty much assume that you're going to get about half of those, and that may be plenty, uh, may be plenty to, to just give you a general trend. So I think that's interesting, and I think it, it, it brings up some interesting discussions about like how often sensors should transmit and how, how do they decide to transmit and things like that. So I think it's going to be a cool project, and I need to wrap it up this week. Uh, so that's mainly my week, and uh, let's keep going. Um, I will take an interlude. We had a late hug report that I'll just read off right now. So from David Gloud, uh, David says, uh, add, a, add a hug report to Foamy Guy and Maker Melissa. I did not notice they added the background color to label. I created that issue and only figured in this meeting that maybe that's what you were talking about. So happy to see an issue be created and get fixed up. Uh, okay, uh, for status updates, next up we have uh, notes from TG Techie. 
Uh, TG Techie says, I, I ran a CircuitPython workshop that had four attendees and went very well. Not only did we cover blinking and breathing in LED, but we were also able to add a sensor in really quickly using the power of CircuitPython. Although I did forget that hardware dnits in CircuitPython right after the script ends, uh, but it made for great live debugging and docs usage. Uh, we'll, do, we'll definitely do uh, another sometime. Uh, made a small fix to the CircuitPython RGB display rotation pull requests. Uh, next up, the motherboard for the not dumb watch came in and was able to test the power, charging, and backlight boost circuitry. The not dumb watch is a CircuitPython running, CircuitPython running watch similar to a smartwatch with a touchscreen, USB-C port, and graphical user interface running on the NRF52840. I need to learn how to reflow solder to attach the Raytac NRF52840 module and the water-resistant USB Type-C connector to the watch. So thanks for the update, TG Techie. Scrolling up to the top, we have uh, Andrew. Yeah, so uh, last week I was working on the uh, Adafruit Clue pinout, um, which we've already talked about a couple times. Mm -hmm. And then, oops, and then was also working on a mag sensor bar graph, just graphing out the values from the uh, onboard mag sensor that's on the Clue in real time. Um, it just kind of scrolls to the end of the screen and then wraps back around and keeps uh, logging the X, Y, and Z values from the graph sense from the mag sensor. And then I broke my screen. So oh, no. first thing on the uh, agenda for this week is replace my broken screen, which should be in the mailbox as we speak. Um, and then just continue working on graphs for uh, various sensors that are on that clue board just to familiarize myself with uh, display I.O. and pulling those sensors. Mm -hmm. And then get some more testing hardware ordered so that I can answer more questions in the chat and actually have the hardware to back up what I'm suggesting. Awesome. And uh, always feel free to reach out to me if you have display I.O. questions or, or things in general. Happy to help. Sure. OK, next up we have Brent. Hello. Um, the past week or a few, I've been working on a pure Python driver for Wiznet's uh, W5. It's like the W5K family of Ethernet chips. It's what's on the Ethernet feather wing. and the uh, PoE Ethernet wing that's coming out externally, not Adafruit. I forgot who's making it. Saw it on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be easier to add more chips down the road because it's in Python and not in C. I finished up the driver and a C Python socket-like object implementation. Unfortunately, I figured out that the uh, WizNet modules don't have built-in uh, DHCP or DNS implementations. Mm -hmm. The ESP32 is really nice for us to use um, because the uh, firmware, the Nina firmware that it runs on has these implementations built in. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm adding them manually, and I actually have a bunch of Wireshark captures open right now, and I'm debugging it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll be adding them this week, and then I'll be checking compatibility with existing CircuitPython libraries like requests and mini MQTT. I forgot to give a hug report to Scott for um, taking a look at ESP32 spy and requests. Um, a lot of really interesting improvements have been made to there. And I'm excited to pull them in and test it on my hardware. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this library will release later this week, depending on how quickly um, the DNS implementation happens. Uh, DCP I'll probably finish tomorrow. Um, these are like fairly large files uh, based off of uh, what WizNet um, provided for reference. So it takes a little bit. But um, I'm excited to not provide a static IP address anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, that's not for like the, the circuit Python goal. So um, that's about it. Awesome, thanks, Brent. Okay, uh, next up we have notes from C Grover. C Grover says uh, completed and tested the circuit Python daylight savings time detector slash adjuster helper and made significant progress on a hardware support library of clock building blocks for RTC based non internet timekeeping. And eliminating the twice yearly clock updates with a new DST helper will be a real time saver. Publish the helper as part of the Cedar Grove Studios slash unit underscore converter repo. Uh, so that's part one. Part two is the latest recording studio project is quotes in the can and off to the CD duplicator vendor. 
uh, in parentheses, yes, CDs are still a thing, in quotes. Uh, the project will be the last with any significant acoustic content. As a result, the old acoustic recording studio was dismantled and is in the process of liquidation. Moving to a simpler 98% digital music instrument studio, more in tune with my transition to solo composition and performance, declutters the studio space as well. All right, from that C. Grover, let's go to Charles. Well, I haven't had a whole lot of progress on anything this week because I've, I've been traveling back and forth from Florida to Pennsylvania, so... Right now, uh, my goal will be to w work more on my keyboard to uh, so I can finally get uh, get my uh, my uh, Sunbox synth working in its entirety. Cool. That's where I am. Awesome. Thanks, Charles. All right. Next up, we have Dan. Okay. So um, one thing I did. Um, is we there's a the NRF chips have eight megahertz SPI and 32 megahertz SPI peripherals, but the 32 megahertz one has serious hardware bugs, so we had it turned off for a while, and finally we worked around um, uh, this bug. It wasn't that much work, but it involves allocating AK of memory it's for exclusive use by that, at least when the SPI is in process. Um, but that's done. It should and it make the clue display noticeably faster. And then there were a whole bunch of uh, small bugs that I fixed, which were trying to knock the um, 5.0.0 um, bug list down to zero. So I listed those here, but I won't bother to read them. Um, I did some cleanup of the BLE various BLE um, service libraries. Some of them had pointers to wrong places, and I added a few that weren't there. And I started looking at uh, BLE-capable uh, thermometers from um, Amazon and other places. So we may have a project about that if we can figure out how they work. They unfortunately don't use a standard service, so we have to reverse engineer them. OK. Thanks, Dan. All right, next up we have David Glaub. I think it's text only. And I'll read it off. Uh, last week, uh, got my clue, exclamation point. Uh, got two BLE heart rate uh, sensors, I assume. Uh, ported my thermal ca camera code to Clue, PyPortal, and of course, PyGamer. Searching for someone with a PyPortal Titano to check the scaling. So uh, let uh, David know if you have a Titano and you want to help uh, with the thermal camera code. Uh, also, uh, got stuck on taking screen captures from display to SD cards. Issue and code to reproduce uh, have been filed. So if anybody wants to help debug that, that would be welcome as well. Um, next week, uh, trying to use my two BLE heart rate monitors simultaneously and display on Clue. And also uh, make a Clue color reader that transmits as a BLE advertisement. All right, and David also notes that if you want to help with the Titano, uh, you don't need the thermal camera. Uh, you just have, uh, David has code that will uh, <laughs> will just uh, test it for you without having the camera actually on there too. Okay, uh, I'm going to now read off for Drew. Drew says, uh, have been working with Alex Camilo and Michael Welling to validate Rev1 of Open Hardware Summit Badge so we can go to full production. I'm, I'm now looking to make a CircuitPython app to display the Open Hardware Summit schedule on the badge. Thinking about adding pull-up and pull-down support to GPIO lines and blanket now that GPIOD supports that functionality with the new Linux 5.5 release. And there's a link there to a blog post about Linux 5.5. Okay, uh, next up we have Foamy Guy. Uh, so last week I had the uh, implemented colored backgrounds for the display I/O text uh, label library, and then I also uh, did some work on a tile map game example I'm making for the Pi Gamer and Pi Badge, um, and then I did some work on uh, some of you guys might have seen this in the chat room go by, but I got found some weirdness with the audio mixer, um, so I did a little bit more work on that, and then next week I need to finish that up and actually get the uh, the issue filed. 
Um, I need to next week also work on the pilot uh, stuff in the tile map game. And then I also want to get back to the Neo Trellis example that I was working on as well. So that's what I got going on. Awesome. Thanks, Fumi Guy. All right. Next up, we have Geek Guy, who's text only. So uh, time codes and talking. It's hard. Uh, Geek Guy says, uh, add in an example to the HT16K33 library to show how to do animations, including several examples. Modify the brightness property of the HT and 16K33 to use floats like Display.io does. And lastly, modify the set digit raw function to return errors if the bit mask or digit is out of range. And next up we have Jeff. Hi again. I've just been doing small amounts of work, mostly on uh, MicroPython ULab. One thing that I was excited about is we now have a basic CI infrastructure. It, uh, when you commit to MicroPython ULab or do a pull request, it's going to build the uh, build it against the master branch of MicroPython and run some tests. What we need are useful tests. There's just one, and it uh, really doesn't test very thing, anything very interesting. And just to note that I'll be pretty much gone from Discord and GitHub until the 25th. The next part of our vacation is all about uh, seeing friends, so uh, that leaves me less time to come and fool around with all this computer stuff. Mm -hmm. So have a good week, guys. You too, Jeff. Thanks. And uh, as a reminder to everyone, please take time like Jeff is taking time and I took time over the weekend. Uh, we don't want anybody to burn out here. We're here for the long haul. So if you find yourself being tired and needing a break, please just uh, let us know so we we don't have to wonder why you disappeared. But please take the time for yourself and, and take care of yourself. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's our, our, our weekly PSA on, on work-life balance. Uh, next up, we have Katni. And let us know so we don't ping you. Yes. Yeah. All right. So uh, I realized I never actually finished my notes. Um, last week, I blogged some newly released guides. I completed guide pages, uh, updated guide pages for three clue demos that I wrote, which is spirit level, height calculator, and temperature and humidity monitor. Updated the FT. 232H guide to include the new rev of the board that we released, wrote and documented a slideshow example for Clue, uh, released all the libraries with commits since last release, um, and then adapted the PyBadger library to work on Clue, um, which turned out to be very ugly. And so um, decided to refactor PyBadger entirely in the same way that we refactored the Circuit Playground library. Um, to properly include Clue and not automatically detects which board is connected and imports the proper features for that board, which currently supports Clue, PyBadge, PyBadge LC, um, ostensibly Edge Badge, and PyGamer. Um, so uh, it no longer has to check whether or not the board has a joystick to provide you with the joystick features um, because it only imports those features if you attach a Pie Gamer, etc. Um, the there was enough differences between those boards that the amount of checking that became involved in the library was um, was was ridiculous. <laughs> basically, um, it because the accelerometer is different on Clue, and like it, it just so constantly checking like for um, attributes in in the board module. Um, wasn't the greatest way to go about it. So this is much cleaner, much easier to read, and allows for expanding it further if we choose to do so. So this week, uh, I'm going to finish documenting and testing the PyBadger refactor. Thank you, Melissa, again, for helping me test that. Um, and then past that, maybe I didn't really. There's not much past that at the moment. Um, we're going to go back to doing uh, more Clue uh, demos. So. Um, I think the next one up is, is Compass. Uh, Lamore wanted to give me code for that, so basically it's whenever she's done with that. Um, but we're still brainstorming um, any kind of um, clue demos, like simple clue demos that we want to do. Uh, the idea being that, as everybody may or may not know, we are giving away clues at PyCon, so we want a lot of um, a lot of options uh, for people to do. And Andrew, that's great. Um, if you, in this for Andrew and anyone else who's interested, if you write up a Clue demo um, and it is unique to um, 
as in we don't already have another one um, of the same thing, uh, please let me know. We can add it to the Clue library. Um, in theory, it should be using that library, but um, we can add it to, to GitHub to make it available. Um, and if not there, we can come up with a place to have a list and that sort of thing so that um, all the demos are in one place and uh, it gives people more stuff to do because uh, the more, the better. Um, and it doesn't have to be simple. It can be slightly complicated um, if, if you, you know, want to write up something super complicated, that's totally fine. We have a advanced um, examples folder uh, for stuff that isn't as uh, straightforward. Uh, so both of those concepts are very welcome. Um, so please let me know if you write up any clue demos and we'll see if it fits with uh, what we're doing. Uh, thanks. Okay, and I think that's that's all I have. I would I would just add to that uh, since we're harnessing the brain power of everybody. Uh, if we had a demo for Clue that involved some BLE sort of broadcast, I just had this idea of what if on the display you have a set of like a kind of like a quilt where you have different tiles of different colors. Um, you could each everybody could broadcast different colors themselves, and you could like basically add them to that uh add them to that quilt as they are near each other and stuff um i don't think you want to like broadcast text because then you could open yourself up to people being kind of like mean and, and abusive about it but maybe something like that where it's just like the people near you and then you could recognize the color you're broadcasting or something um, so yeah something something that involves Lee would be really cool too because everybody will have them uh, and so uh, having a demo that where everybody uses it and it, they interact would be really cool. Uh, yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, and definitely, like you were saying, something something benign like that would be best. Right. <laughs> um, it's difficult to uh, transmit a rude color. Right. So like, I mean, maybe we could get away with like a four by four pixel image. But the more pixels, colors are good. Yeah, the more pixels you have, the more risk you run. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I and that's a very um, high resolution display, relatively speaking. Yeah. Um, I initially, in testing it, um, grabbed all of the bitmaps that I had made for um, for Pi Badge, and they were all very tiny in the corner. Mm -hmm. So, um, very high res display. Uh, I like the color idea um, a lot. And we have um, buttons and touch to uh, work with for um, for inputs and so on you know, to be able to transmit and receive yeah. and that sort of thing. We could also do emoji where like we have an emoji sprite sheet on the device mm -hmm. and you just transmit which one of those you want. Mm -hmm. So the only way that somebody would display something rude is if they modify the bitmap themselves rather than somebody else like triggering something rude on somebody else's badge. Um, yeah, that could also work. Um, I'm taking notes on this. Yeah, I think it'd be really cool. And, uh, yeah, I think it'd blow people's minds a little bit. So I'm going to either propose a new demo probably or feature the previous one. <laughs> I was thinking the other day about using multiple BLE devices that can talk to each other to triangulate each other mm -hmm. to get a sense of the general shape that everything is in. Mm -hmm. um, the demo would be something like you were just mentioning, but people could arrange themselves such that everyone would have a picture, like a, a, a quilt with a design. Hmm. Oh, actually, no, that's a problem. Because <laughs> then they <laughs> could make rude things, so never mind. <laughs> I mean, people will make rude things for themselves. The issue I, sure. the, the concern I have is if they like the rude stuff spreads to people who don't want it. Like yeah. there's a code of conduct to, to help mitigate that, but I don't want somebody like stealthily broadcasting rude things to everybody. Sure. At least not in an example that we created. <laughs> right. Inevitably it's going to happen, but we, we strive to create, you know, welcoming and happy environments. So, yep. um, the, the better that we can do that. Um, yeah, so notes taken. Um, I like the idea. 
cool. I think the color thing is gonna um, is gonna be good. Um, and the emoji sprite sheet is not a bad idea either. So I got that written down. Thanks for the ideas. Awesome. And yeah, uh, other folks let us know if you have other ideas as well. But yeah, we're not actually in the weeds yet. We're just uh, wanting to get there. So let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Katni. Yeah. Uh, let's go on to Melissa. Hello. So last week I wrapped up working on the web serial IMU calibration for the time being because it was just getting too experimental. And when it got too much data, it was getting bogged down and it just would slow to a complete stop. Uh, I work on reviewing PRs and fixing issues on GitHub. I added a couple new shapes to the, the display shapes library and showed that off on show and tell. Um, I hooked up the clue board to a bit buggy and was able to get that completely running using Bluetooth and circuit Python. Although I still want to make use of some of the clue sensors. I created a 3D model viewer that moves a 3D bunny model around using web serial and the clue board. Uh, it was originally created using Euler angles, but I was converted to using quaternions. Um, and now it actually, you can switch between either or. Um, I started helping Katni with testing new Pi Badger code. I worked on getting a, a mini TFT demo working, or the, the mini TFT demo working more consistently uh, because it seems to lock up after running for a little while, but it's still doing that, but not as bad. Um, I started looking into getting uh, web Bluetooth working and looking at some tutorials on that. And this week I'm going to continue working on that. I'm going to continue finishing up testing Katni's code and you know, I'll see if I can come up with any more improvements for the mini TFT thing because it's very similar code that runs on Pi Badger, so there shouldn't be really any issues. So I'm not sure what's up. Hmm. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. OK. We have notes from Noobs. Let me take a time code. They say uh, RTS CTS RS485, uh, first implementation tested and working on the IMX RT1021. Uh, currently porting uh, to other members of the IMX RT family. Requires changes to common HAL bus IO UART construct, so this will be updated over the next few days as part of the same PR process across microcontrollers to get CI happy. Uh, implementation, implementation will throw a not yet implemented for any microcontroller where the integration and test hasn't been done. All right. Next up, we have Sedacious. I have my notes this time. So uh, this past week, I finished uh, the code for uh, the seven puff demo uh, and wrote the guide and published it. It should be out now. Uh, I also um, started and finished the LPS 2x libraries for CircuitPython and uh, Arduino as well. Uh, this will be a um, kind of a catch all driver. For um, the LPS 2 whatever series, the first of which will be the LPS 25. Um, there are other ones that have very similar, if not the same, register map and I2C addresses and stuff. So it's just kind of a plug and play thing for the different ones in that same family. Um, I also uh, assembled and tested the HTS 221, and I am working on the drivers for that today and hopefully. I'll have at least one of them out before the end of the day. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thanks, Sedacious. All right. Last up, we have Summersoft, who's text only. So I'll read that off. Summersoft says, uh, for the last two weeks on the Action CI front, worked on a, out a fix for a breaking change to the third-party action we utilize to upload bundle and library release assets. Thanks again to Crayola and Katni for steering me away from my tunnel vision on the root cause. Uh, for Adabot, uh, added community bundle info gathering to the library report in circuitpython.org slash contributing. <laughs> Updated the GitHub API authentication procedures. Previous process is being deprecated in July. Uh, for Rosy PI, PI, Rosy Pi and Physis EI, uh, finished the node side program to register a node with Physis EI's registrar for push notifications. This includes the hourly rotation of 
generating new keys for use with the HTTP signature authentication, rewrote most of PhysicCI's initial push notification code, largely add additional abstraction and implementing HTTP signature authentication, started working on the PhysicCI code to trigger push notifications when a new GitHub check is created and how the different data sets interact. It is currently very bowl of spaghetti in my mind. Uh, this week, start deeper exploration on my idea for the Great Pilot upgrade of 2020, uh, which with a link to issue two on the Actions CI. Uh, mostly just verifying my assumptions with Adabot patching slash tracking and writing a script to auto upgrade libraries that already pass Pilot 2x. Uh, keep moving forward on Physics CI and notifications, and in the spirit of work-life balance, I'll be out most of this weekend, Friday through Sunday. Mardi Gras awaits. That sounds like a ton of fun. Okay, uh, thank you, Summersoft, and everybody for those updates on what you've been doing. Uh, we are now to the last section of the meeting, which is called In the Weeds. In the Weeds is a chance for us to just discuss whatever we care to discuss. Um, we do it at the end so that uh, we can uh, go into as much depth as we, we'd like. So uh, let's kick it over to Sedacious for the first topic. So uh, I wanted to uh, have us talk about um, stuff relating to the cookie cutter. Um, the first being, what does it mean to release a change to the cookie cutter? Um, obviously, you can you know, make a release in the repo, but if it just sits there and is only ever used for new libraries, um, all the existing libraries are missing out on all those changes. And presumably, we're changing the cookie cutter because we've uh, updated how we want to do something or added something new or something along those lines. Right. Um, so generally speaking, I, I, this is kind of gets to like, how should we go about applying those changes to all the existing repos? Um, I feel like some of them, like, um, you know, the code of conduct or stuff that's just text, there's no code in it, probably should be able to be replaceable without caring about uh, overriding existing content or having to adapt it to the libraries. Anything that's like not using, um, uh, yeah, anything that doesn't like isn't going to break. Basically, I think we can automatically push out, uh, and then stuff that needs to be adapted to um, the cookie cutter, or it has to have the cookie cutter applied based on the the stuff from the library. Uh, that'll be a little trickier. Um, I'm I'm guessing probably for now, the answer is going to be just manually apply it, but. I think there's probably a better way, or at least a half solution that gets us most of the way without requiring um, us to manually touch every single repo. Yeah, I mean, I think Summersoft's done some work on that of like automating patching. I don't think Cookie Cutter actually has a way to just upgrade from one commit to another, which I think would be cool, but. I don't know. I think I generally think like getting the Cookie Cutter is the first step because you just don't want to introduce more repos with the older version. Right. Um, but it's really hard to think of a way to like really propagate it back without having a manual step. Yeah. The one problem is that we don't or haven't been so far uh, saving the configuration that was fed into it. So there's no yeah. way to really re replay anything without, right. um, figuring out that input somehow. Right. Um, right. So I don't know. I, I, I don't have any real interest, obviously. So, um, well, I think that could yeah. be the first step. <laughs> yeah, sure. That could yeah. be the first step of just like making, like pushing that state and, and also just maybe like the commit that the cookie cutter is at, right? Like then, you know, I think the next step is even though you manually fix stuff, what you do is you create a thing that can tell you the things that have already been fixed and the things that haven't. Right. Like right. Keeping track of just like, these are like, okay, here's the four repos that have inherited this change from the cookie cutter simply because they were created after versus mm -hmm. all these other ones that haven't, or these ones that have been updated or something. Yeah. Um, um 
it, it might be worth um, at some point in time, like going through the individual pieces in the cookie cutter and seeing like what are things that could be easily or just completely, you know, freely have applied um, right. to see if there's some way we can automate at least some of it. Right. Yeah, I think it's a great question and it's worth putting time towards. Cool. If anyone has any ideas, feel free to ping me. <laughs> You're on the forefront of it, I think, along with Summersoft. Um, I have one other thing, but there's other people that uh, press their, put their stuff in first. So you can go on to uh, Johnny's. Uh, okay. Yeah, who's who wanted to talk about Black? Oh, did I do that? <laughs> no, I don't think I did, but I do want to talk about that. Okay. Um, I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> I, can give, uh, I can give some background that I probably haven't. Like sure. I, I yeah. went to dinner with John at Pi Cascades and I mentioned to him that I would love it if we could do black on everything and circuit Python. And this was the day before the Pi Cascade sprint. So that's I think when he worked on all of that or they worked on all of that. Uh so I don't know what their plan is in terms of uh going forwards but um yeah let me tg techie i'll answer uh tg techie asks what is black um so black is a code formatter for python uh most co code formatters are uh really configurable and there's been this movement within programming in general to and it was kind of started by go where they have a go format command but basically uh just saying in order for code in this language to be consistent, we actually just need to decide on one format to rule that everybody can just uh, get on board with. And so black is that for Python. It's the, we don't really configure anything. We don't, you just pick to choose black. And now that means that like the code format will be the same everywhere that it's used. Um, and some of the interesting decisions they've made, like if you look at, code that's been formatted with black it doesn't necessarily look like the code you've written but uh, they've put a lot of time and thought into uh, how to make diffs look better uh, so one weird thing that they do that is actually i think really good is that you'll see uh, for in functions one parameter per line and that really uh, it looks kind of weird to me when, when you're browsing code but it means that when your function arguments change in a diff it's actually really easy to see what changed um, so yeah, I don't know what John's plan uh, going forward is. Uh, they've done a lot of that work within Facebook. John works at Facebook, so um, that's why they decided to pick it up. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how much time of theirs will have going forwards. Um, so it's kind of in the state that Sedacious was just talking about, where it's in cookie cutter. Like I created a new repo and I, I failed the black check and I had to make it black. So. Um, Beware of that with new libraries. Uh, if you need help with it, let me know. But I think it is worthwhile doing. I just don't know when we'll get back to, to the back catalog of libraries for it. Um, I remembered uh, some of the things I was thinking about. Um, one of them was in the PR for adding those checks. Um, uh, I brought up that I had previously run into scenarios where at least the version of Pilot that I was using uh, disagreed with Black about how things should be done. Right. Um, and I had to defer to PyLint because you can't merge without it. Right. Um, so um, that's something I assume it must have been addressed. Um, either that or I missed. Um, I believe it was. I, that. Yeah. I believe we just turned off the checks that in PyLint that disagreed with Black. Right. OK, great. Um, so that's one thing. Another is the idea of. I saw part of a talk by someone about Black and um, what I got from it, which may not have been what they were saying, uh, was um, one of the things you can do is just automatically apply mm -hmm. Black mm -hmm. rather than having to manually run it because it isn't going to be making any breaking changes. It's just changing formatting. Right. Um, so there's no harm in just applying it and 
presumably committing it. Right. So either we could do that as a action step before the tests get run, mm -hmm. or we could, um, or maybe also uh, give, uh, make and give out tools or make available tools to um, apply and test both Black and Pylint and probably building the docs as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I've written a couple of small tools for myself that I use to do that. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, very small scripts or aliases. Um, I'm happy to share those, but I think also, you know, just making them or something similar to them more widely available would be useful. Agreed. Cool. Yeah, I yeah. Like I mean, that sounds like a great place to start is just getting those in a repo that people can use. And then cool. We Will do. There. Two folks are typing. I don't know if that's related. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Summer Sauce says caveat. It's one more tool to maintain. Which is true. But I feel like scripts, like small scripts like that, can actually be more in the like documentation category rather than a tool. Sure. Yeah. Totally. Um, all right. Uh, Doubt and Muse is going to talk about that. So let's go on to Jeff next. Uh, so when I saw this stuff about background color support go by, I noticed that everywhere in Python where we support a color or transparent, there's handling on the Python code for the none case. And I wonder if there's an obvious reason that I'm overlooking that we don't do that down at the core level in C code hmm. and get the option to simplify all of that stuff. Because as far as I see, the none value means transparent, and then the the bits of the color value don't have any meaning. Right. So is there a reason not to enter that as a feature request? And maybe I could potentially look at the um, look at implementing it. But you know, is it worth uh, entering as an issue feature request style? Uh, I think that's fine if you want to do that. OK, it makes I sense. will put that in. Thank you. OK, let's go back to Sedacious. Did we cover it? Uh, no. Uh, so this is uh, this came out of my CircuitPython 2020 post. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the several things that I mentioned um, wanting to give some attention to is um, documentation broadly, but more specifically, the fact that we have lots of really good documentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at times it can be hard to find. Um, I've noticed a change since uh, joining the community that using Google to say a CircuitPython thing works better than I remember it working, uh, which is great. But yep. um, generally speaking, I think um, there's some work to be done on um, making kind of cross-linking documentation and uh -huh. references to libraries or stuff like that. Um, that's one thing um, that wasn't exactly what I want to talk about just now. But um, the I, anyway, so I ended up talking with uh, Timon uh, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And he had a couple of suggestions. He pointed at the Open Frameworks documentation as being a really good example of um, you know, easy to browse, useful documentation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I should rewind a little bit and state the question that I put in the notes, which was, uh, should we revisit the template that we're using in the cookie cutter for the documentation? Um, I think it's great that we have it, and it's a great first step. But I think probably there's a chance that uh, formatting it differently um, could be useful. Um, there's not a ton of information that you need out of the documentation, for example, for a library. Usually it's what functions are available and you know where's an example of how to use it. Right. And that can easily fit on one page, mm -hmm. uh, including links to GitHub and wherever else. So right. um, I think maybe we should uh, look at that again and see if we can um, rejigger things to make it more uh, usable. Um, that kind of gets to what Timon was talking about. The Open Frameworks documentation has um, expandable uh, sections on one page for every 
broad category of um, of uh, classes or a category of functionality that's in their um, library. Um, and then you can expand on each one of them and it shows just a list of all of the functions for that um, section of the code. And right. you can then click on the functions and see, you know, uh, parameter descriptions and hopefully um, small examples for each one of them. Mm -hmm. So um, something like that on circuitpython.org would be super cool. Um, obviously, it'd be great to get it tied in with uh, Adabot or some other automated process. Um, but Timon also suggested, and I think there's some merit to the idea of uh, curating the documentation a little bit mm -hmm. um, and just like pulling out good examples of stuff and um, maybe you know highlighting things that um, you know we know get a lot of use like right. NeoPixel and right. you know put extra effort into those things mm -hmm. um, or you know it's just applying some human knowledge to uh, what makes the most sense to be worked on yeah um, so yeah I love documentation I even have a sticker on my laptop that says it um, <laughs> someone gave it to me at Supercon and it's uh, it's one of the strengths if not the main strength of Adafruit. Yep. Um, so I think it uh, deserves to be given a, um, some attention over the year. So that's one of the many things I'm going to try and uh, put some extra time into. Cool. Yeah, I think um, it's certainly important. And I like all the ideas that you have. Um, it's interesting to me that we have this problem of too much documentation. Uh, I think that's a great problem to have. And I think what you're getting as it like, we just need to figure out how to structure it better so it all works together. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, and, and also potentially avoiding duplication, which would help it be more maintainable. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's another thing that I've thought about. It's like, hey, documentation is great, but one of the worst forms of documentation is to make is like videos right. because they go out of date super quick and they're hard to recreate. Right. Um, not that we're making videos, though maybe that would be cool. But um, generally speaking, maintaining documentation, the more you have, the bigger task it is to keep it maintained. Right. Yeah, and there's different types of documentation as well. And I, I can look it up. I found this talk, uh, I think, from PyCon Australia. And I've linked to it prior where they talk about the different types of documentation. Like a learn guide is a tutorial versus like the read the docs, which is just an API reference. Um, and like how those two things work together, um, right. and, and serve different roles. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, um, please do, uh, share that when you can find it, yeah. uh, SummerSoft <laughs> called out, um, something that's been, uh, on my list of grievances for a while. And that's just, I really do not like RST. It's kind of a pain to work with. I, I don't know why I'm mentioning this because mm -hmm. redoing all the documentation in Markdown or something would just be monumental and maybe not necessary. Um, but nonetheless, does anyone share my dislike of RST or am I just a weirdo? I really dislike it, but it it enforces some things that Markdown wouldn't. So, and that's the, that's the thing I have with it is like, if there was an alternative, then I would be open to using it, but I don't know of any documentation that allows you to provide the structure that RST does. Um, like knowing, you, knowing what something is a function and what the parameters are for that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's syntax is kind of miserable and it's, it, it's not, it, it's documented in a way that makes it hard to look things up, but right. that's, I don't know. My, my, one of the things that just made me pull my hair was trying to put a tool into documentation. Um, it's just super, super picky about, you know, how you format stuff and it doesn't give you very good errors. It just says, Oh, there's a missing space here. But the, the line reference isn't the actual line of the code. It's the line within the doc string. Right. Um, so it's all just, I don't know. This, this. Let's let's maybe give some thought to that, because that would be, uh, it's just not user friendly, right? When I first, like I, the worst part of writing my first library was doing the documentation. Yeah. 
because it was just a pain in the butt. So I'm done. I hear you, <laughs> but I don't know what a better option is. And well, I, I mean, the here. thing that just came to mind was presumably Black knows something about how to figure out the structure of code um, or many other tools, presumably. Um, well, the other challenge, so, the other challenge is uh, how we document built-in stuff, right? Because right. in library land, we have Python code and we can do AST sort of things that know that like you're you're modifying mm -hmm. like the doc string of a function. Mm -hmm. But internally to Circuit Python, we don't have that, right? We just have the RST, the bare RST, and then the question becomes. And this is a dis decision we can make is like, do we want to um, move away from RST in the library side and only have it native? Like maybe, maybe that's a good solution because there are options when it comes to documentation for Python code, but I don't know of anything like there's not an equivalent for, um, for like the native C stuff. Um, what about Doxygen? But do like Doxygen's, for defining for, for documenting C code, not Python code. Right, right. When right, like right, we right. wanna we wanna pretend we're Python code. And there's stuff I want to do around that as well for like having reasonable autocomplete. Like I, yes, I would actually please. like to have like tight annotations for everything and, and doc strings for all the native functions as well. Um right. so, because then editors can autocomplete all that. Oh. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's uh, some yeah. thinking to be done here. What I was getting at with uh, Black was just that we don't have to have one tool that parses um, markup and then also knows about structure. Perhaps two right. tools could work together. I don't know. There's there's many different ways to uh, approach this. Yeah, and I think we have to, like, you know, I, I when I made the decision way back to do RST both in both places, like the reality is, is that the libraries far outweigh the core in terms of contributions and code, right? So like mm -hmm. if it means that we get more, better contributions on the library side and those of us working in the core have to know the intricacies of RST, but nobody else does, like that's probably worth, that's probably worth doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and like, the my main that would help with having to make people deal with rst okay. the it can be you know the other problem i have is just how it's just currently laid out which can be addressed by changing you know the, the template right um so that would be great i mean that would i think would be a good solution just to let the libraries do their own thing and you know because there's not a better solution have the core keep yeah. using RST. Yeah, although I think what David's kind of getting at is like we could also just do inline Python stubs in the C code instead. Like there is a Python stub format, which is what we were going to try to auto generate from RST, but maybe the thing that makes it would make more sense is to actually put the stub in line like we do RST right now. Mm -hmm. So you what you do is you would do def function name parameters type annotations, triple quotes for your function thing, but then you just put dot 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 in the as the message body, and that's like a stub. Like yeah, that could be the other way to do it. It's just yeah, that would that would work too. And then we just use Python syntax to define what the API is. Sounds good. So yeah, we could play around with that. Cool. Alrighty. All right, any other comments on that? Definitely worth thinking about. I, I do kind of like that stub process. Um, OK, I just I, I know that we're long in the tooth. Uh, we're an hour and a half in. But I, I just wanted to ask Dan to give a recap uh, on where you think we are on 5.0. Because uh, you've been doing kind of heading that work. And I wonder how close you think we are. Let me, let me just look at the. Open issues. <laughs> I guess one thing I'm thinking is like we should probably get a new beta out if we're not close to an RC. 
And so I have, there are there about three open uh, PRs, which will knock off several of these. Yep. Um, there's a couple, I, there's something, there's um, a question of whether we should add a timeout to I2C synchronous stuff to catch I2C hangs. Um, that's 2253. Yeah, I'll send out, I'll and, post a link here. Yeah, and Sedacious, you have the, I have, I have to see what about your I2C bug. And I want to look at the 5XO and 5XX milestones also okay. to see if there's anything that really should be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the other thing, which is not really there, which is not a bug, but maybe should, it, was that, it would be nice to get, I don't know, this is a question about whether we should think about trying to get ULAB into 5.0 yep. or not. I don't think it matters. Uh because I would be more than happy to do a 5.1 with ULAB, right? Like, one thing we should remember is that 5.0 to this point, I think, can just be about stability. And then we can always add stuff without much uh, destabilization or, um, like, we're not changing any API, so we don't have to do a bump. Um, right. I think the reason not to change, add ULAB now is because I would say that the API is still in some in, is flux in flux, right? A little bit, right? But I think it's it's being pinned down, but it's not quite there yet, and maybe it shouldn't hold up. That's and David Glad and said it. Five one with ULAB is a good marketing for ULAB. I think that's true. Actually, right. that it would, would split be, out. It would be not just one. It would be the feature for five one or right. something like that. Right. Right. Or... Which sounds sounds good. Yeah. Um, all right, so I, I will see uh, the, these last few things, which to see whether we could really defer them or not. Okay. Because some of them are bugs, but they're not. They seem to be rather rare, right. and so we may be able to defer some of them. Yeah. Uh, Dan, do you have everything you need for me to look at the bug I reported, or do you need me to do? Or... I'll, I'll, if I don't, I'll ask you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Great. Cool. Um, um, and then. And, and Scott, if you have some time to do, it doesn't have to be right away, but you, there, you, you just got back. So uh, you, you, I assume you'll be going through your emails. Yes. In fact, I'm mostly through my emails. That just means I have tabs open. Okay. So right. I'm, I'm going to grab lunch and I'll do the video stuff and I'll get, I'll get caught up on all the reviews. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you have a two-step process for... I do. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Uh, but it works. Um, yeah, that's fine. The the one thing I do want to do is I do want to turn the Circuit Python editing BLE API off um, for the stable release because it's so. You want me to write an issue for that? Yeah, that would be great if you want to do. Okay, I'll do that. Um, I want to do that, but I want to make sure that we do that in a way that it's secure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I just, I just had this picture of three thousand people getting it, and then somebody discovering that they can make their badge talk to everyone else's badge and like put malicious code to pie code on it. Uh, right, or even just it's just confusing because it's advertising when you're not expecting it to advertise. So I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it needs it's um it served its purpose in really pushing the way that we think about BLE. And like, especially just in terms of like how much RAM we give everything as well. Uh, but I don't think it's quite to the point where people actually get value out of it. Um, in exchange, like, I want to add it back, but I want to add it back when it's ready. Um, and and <laughs> ready in a way that doesn't mean that anybody can just put files on your device. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was, I was brainstorming a bit about like, how do you... Like, what would your device do if somebody tries to pair? And, like, you could show a pairing code and, like, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I want to get there. But uh, I would put that kind of in the same bucket as ULAB of, like, it could be a 5.2, 5.3, 5.4. Five, five, uh, just fine. Okay. So I'm just adding an issue right now. Thanks for doing that. I should have done okay. that earlier. All right. Okay. Um, I haven't seen anything else pop up in the doc. Uh, Dan, thanks for the update on 5.0. Um, I think uh, if I had to write a summary, it would be getting close, uh, looking at the 5x related milestones. 
owns and uh, ULab won't make 5.0, but we'll be happy to do a big push with a 5x release. will be the highlight of sorry I'm taking notes okay let me wrap us up this has been the circuit python weekly meeting for February 18th if I remember right uh, it's Tuesday normally it's on Mondays uh, everybody's welcome to attend this meeting uh, we love to hear about what you're doing with circuit python <laughs> Uh, you can join the meeting by going to the Adafruit Discord server, which is adafru.it slash discord. Uh, we're there all week in the text channel. We're in the voice channel on Mondays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, the normal time for this meeting. Uh, if you'd like to get pinged about uh, updates on the meeting, the, uh, links to the note doc, notes doc and all of that, uh, let us know. We'll add you to the circuit Pythonistas role, which makes your name show up in purple as well. I uh, love to have people there. And uh, again, if you end up not doing CircuitPython for a while, we're happy to remove you from that as well. Um, as I said earlier, this meeting has been recorded. It'll go up on the Adafruit YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Adafruit. It's available on podcast services as an audio only thing. And uh, the notes doc is in the description there, along with the, the GitHub repo that has all the notes, which then will also link back to the videos for it. Um, I think that's it. Uh, we should be on normal schedule next week on Monday. So, uh, we'll see everybody next Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Thanks again for listening in. Thanks everyone. Hey, Tanya.